Smita Malipatil. She is the CEO of Epseco, a specialist application and cloud security company. With over 20 years of experience in technology and management spread across enterprise and startups, Smita Malipatil has a deep understanding of what it takes to run successful companies in this hyper digital world. A successful entrepreneur in her own right, Smita founded and ran one of the UK's leading digital production agencies for seven years before it was acquired by a leading UK PLC in the communications sector. She's also an alumna of Harvard Business School and a self-proclaimed geek and expert in the offshoring and outsourcing sectors. In this era of digital innovation and remote work, Smita aspires to provide leadership to enterprises and top quality startups with global ambitions on how to win in a global workforce. She's also passionate about mentoring women and encouraging them to lean in to take ownership of their work lives. Welcome, Smita. It is such a pleasure to speak with you today. Thank you very much. And that was a very gracious introduction. Oh, no. Thank you so much for agreeing to speak. It is, I'm sure it's going to be inspiring. And all of us, we cannot wait to hear about your journey. So why don't we start with that, Smita? You know, what has your, been your journey so far as an entrepreneur? All right. How far back do you want to go, Diti? As far as... But, but, Okay, so I always believe in this, inspiration strikes at any moment. So wherever that happened for you, the spark of entrepreneurship, where did that begin? Absolutely, I am a uh, Bangalore person. I studied here, started my career here, and I've worked across India, Southeast Asia, Europe, and the US. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you know, at that time, uh, long, long ago when I was in college, when you got out of uh, MBA, the first thing you'd want to do is, you know, become a consultant or join the IT sector. Mm -hmm. So I decided uh, to follow the later path being in Bangalore and um, started my career with IBM. Worked okay. with a couple of other um, larger IT companies, uh, but largely in the finance and the marketing space. I am not a techie. I can't quote, though I do understand the technology sector as a result mm -hmm. of my work experience. Um, moving on from Bangalore, I've worked in Bombay and then finally got my, you know, uh, break, um, as I call it, uh, working as a management consultant uh, in the UK. Um, worked there for a couple of years um, on projects that involve both work onshore in the UK and Europe as well as offshore in India. And given, you know, that um, I come from Asia and I have had work experience in Europe, I was able to understand how work cultures are different. And at that point in time was when the outsourcing, you know, boom had happened. Mm -hmm. companies had discovered India and its technical talent and its resources, so had started to explore setting up larger bases in India, right? And at that point in time being, uh, you know, uh, a new industry, they were looking for people who could come in with expertise in helping manage the whole processes, right? Some of them tried on their own, uh, some succeeded, some did not succeed. There are some rather large examples of companies that did not do very well in the outsourcing. Mm. Um, and so, you know, the, the bigger topics then were how do we succeed in the offshoring space? And of course, you know, uh, with the little understanding that I'd had across both the spaces, um, I was uh, picked up by a leading management consulting firm and I started working on consulting jobs in the offshoring space. And, and it was during these jobs that the aha moment, as you described, happened, right? Mm. Um, so there, you know, companies sort of sought to resolve the offshoring uh, situations and, and uh, success scenarios by, by focusing uh, rightly at that point in time on the cultural differences, right? Oh, this is a new country, new language, uh, new weather. Um, so how do we get people to, you know, to, to deliver? But uh, the aha moment for me was not the fact that you spoke British English or American mm -hmm. English or Indian English, mm -hmm. because communication is uh, less of an issue. It's more the work culture that was different, right? It wasn't mm -hmm. my Hindi is not understandable. It's that when you tell me in English, get something done in the UK, it means something different. Whereas in India, it means something else. Right? Yeah. Something done in India normally means 
sort of get it till there and then we'll see how we'll figure the rest of it out right mm. we also come from a culture where saying no is considered a bad thing right um, can you do this and immediately your uh, you know the junior in the office will be like yes 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 knowing full well that he doesn't know how to do he's a java person he's not a yeah. project manager right so um learning to say no is also slightly difficult at least in the cultures of those days today of course you know uh, work culture has evolved in india and so it's a slight nuances that's what i noticed at that point in time were the make or break of how a project would you know be successful or not and uh, that's why me and one of the guys um uh, within uh, the management consulting firm um had long discussions and said hey you know what if this is what seems to make things work or not work so we then um took the bold step uh, decided to walk the talk as consultants normally don't do and set up our own um, offshore consulting firm um we did very well uh, consulted across automobile sectors uh, pharmaceutical sectors and the media sector because again you know media was also picking up new media was a big thing digital at that point in time became the buzzword that the web3 is today you know crypto and web3 is all the rage and everybody wants to get in on it and mm-hmm. back in those days in the early 2000s digital was the buzzword and everybody wanted to get on the digital game and they their idea of digital was you know let's have a website up right that was as far as we went but yeah. of course we knew that there was more to be done and of course the resource base existed in india so a lot of companies were also looking to set up in digital so we consulted on a few um, digital jobs and said you know there is a big unserviced gap here and uh, the entrepreneurs that we were at that point in time we set up a second entity called kion kion service digital uh, companies work with large media agencies so the wpps the publicists of the world this is pre the mergers that have happened today they were all separate entities so we started working with them work with large uh, brands in the uk as well and service them on helping them understand the strategy between how you know um, creative as uh, sort strategy between how digital is thought about and then delivered right So um I mean a simple example is when uh, Land Rover was launching its new um, Explorer um they had this fabulous print campaign out they had the glossiest shiny brochures available to be mm-hmm. picked up at all of the major uh, automotive retail stores their own stores they um, published this uh, they had these nice ads that they would put out in these glossy magazines that would go up to the car and motoring experts um and of course amongst the wealth uh, managers and then they said oh in all of them we've got www.soandsourl.com put up um and so we need a website for it and of course their agency at that point in time um had taken the brochure with its nice glossy images and converted the uh, pdf into a online <laughs> html page with these massive images that just wouldn't load you know so yeah. simple things like that right when people go online they're not really looking at glossy images the internet does not serve glossy high uh, bandwidth downloads very well mm-hmm. and so people go online they're looking really for more information right they have the brochures they see you are they go online they want to know more about what's happening with that right what are people talking about the um, the um, the the model of the uh, car that was being launched how does it compare with other things so you know the strategy behind a digital execution is very different to the strategy between behind a uh below the line production right right these were the things that we brought in as our uh, you know expertise in terms of uh, digital strategy execution um then the media agencies would go about and understand it and come back with these digital designs and deliver them um we also then found a further issue with uh, when creative is designed versus how creative is developed right so production in itself is a very difficult piece it's nice to have a great web design but to, if you don't convert it well if you don't optimize it for all of the browsers then you know it looks great on some computer uh, screens and it doesn't look so great at that you know on the others yeah. plus the fact that mobile also slowly started evolving people started looking at more mobile based uh, screens so um we set up a strategy company in the uk and we set up a production center in india and of course the company grew um and it was it was a very exciting work at that point in time quite cutting edge so we set up a large team in india specializing in delivering uh you know um new media solutions um at that point in time not just websites there were banners that were quite popular there was uh, i don't know if anybody remembers a technology called flash but macromedia flash 
<laughs> was a big thing that yeah. I launched with and got big with before they made PDF their mainstream uh, mm-hmm. documentation tool. So evolved. Uh, uh, similarly, the company also grew. And uh, of course, um, sort of, you know, uh, many years after its existence, I mean, through the growth stage, we did have a lot of companies looking to acquire, but uh, we were very excited about what we're doing. We were discovering new things every day, so saw no reason. But of course, after a few years, uh, you know, a couple of uh, interesting offers came our way. And then we realized we really had ambition to scale and it would be a lot easier to scale with a lot more money than it will be with a lot less money organically. Mm -hmm. And so we took one of the offers that uh, actually was a perfect complement to our offering. It was a large printing company Mm -hmm. who was looking uh, at a a possible shortage of revenues because print was moving digital. They had no digital expertise. We were like, you know what, this immediately gives us access to a client base that we would have uh, taken a few more years to get on board. Large, um, large retail organizations, large uh, banking organizations and financial services companies. So we, you know, shook our hands and that's how we were acquired. And um, I continued with them through my earnout, took a year off and then have been uh, working in the AI ML space and now in the cybersecurity space. Oh, that's brilliant. Uh, what I could hear quite a bit in the story that you share is, you know, two things. One, um, I think it's about staying aware of what's mm-hmm. happening around you. Mm-hmm. Figuring it out whether you know that's something is that the direction you want to take or do you need to pivot? Where are you headed with that, right? And of course, I think one of the things which you demonstrated with the story that you shared is about leveraging the resources that you have around you, right? Having a production unit in India and another one in UK, right? So, yeah. where are resources best placed, and how can we leverage each resource in a way that helps us grow and helps us scale? Um, I, I could definitely hear a lot of that in the story that you shared. So uh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, I think that's very inspiring in its own way, right? Uh, but I'm sure, you know, everything is not as rosy as it seems. I'm sure you faced some challenges around, along the way uh, as you were going about starting up these companies. So uh, what were some of the challenges that you faced, Mita? Um, You're absolutely right. In, in, in hindsight, the story that I say does sound like it was also... <laughs> sailing and hunky-dory yeah. but it is a struggle as 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 is most entrepreneurship offerings as are most uh, leadership roles right yeah the world is definitely changing fast to to mouth the cliche again mm-hmm. and if you are not running you will not keep up with where you are and um, for me I think uh, the challenge was not so much the learning the learning is what keeps me going the mm. challenging uh, part for me was to keep people going with you right yeah it's taking the team along and yeah. you have a team that's open to it that is willing to learn that is willing to pivot that can handle the fast moving pace especially in the media space then it's 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 great but you know you do encounter um, and i think again it's a cultural piece right uh, it could be not just not just in india i think southeast asia generally to a certain degree certain pockets uh, in uh, the european countries are uh, reasonably reticent to change. I don't think they're mm. reticent, but they're scared. They're like, oh, what's going to happen? Can I cope with it? So The fear uh, of the unknown, right? Yeah. It is, it is. And for me, the challenge was to slow down enough to ensure that everybody is. Uh, so you, you're worried, you're worried, you want to pivot, but you're like equally, you can't pivot so fast that the, you know, the apple cart tumbles, right? Mm. So um, it's always trying to um, balance that in, in your um, high growth uh, organization. Mm. And uh, luckily for me, I did have a couple of people I could lean on and talk to who, you know, um, a heard me out. So it was more of venting. So sometimes when you speak, you're able to get solutions for yourself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because they had good suggestions on how to handle these situations. Mm. So I am grateful to, you know, uh, to uh, my luck in having these people along the journey. So that yeah. was one of the challenges. And I think a lot of people probably face that even today Yeah. Uh, in, in ensuring that you have the right team that go with you. And as I said, I've been very lucky that at least my, you know, my second level of managers and, and their ability to be lead people has also been um, great. Mm. Yeah. Um, one of my um, other challenges, which, you know, is is a learning that I then, you know, try and share as much as I can with the new entrepreneurs is the fact that you need to keep your head above, above water and look outward all the time. Yeah. If you're busy firefighting, if you're busy looking inside all the time, you fail to see where you're headed, right? Yeah. And so the challenge of, of, I think, being a little immature 
in that sense that you know you want to do it all um uh, is a learning that i've had and mm. uh, overcome and um uh, is is something that uh, you know that i'd like to share with people apart from that honestly speaking i think um if you are a um a pragmatic person which is sorry a british word for practical and you are able to you know keep your head focused on the job um a lot of people ask me did you face cultural challenges did they see you as a brown person mm-hmm. uh, cuz i was largely you know one of the few that operated in the white world um board seat in a white company and all of that but i was like no i never felt that nor did anybody make me feel that i think it's mm-hmm. really down to capabilities and if you're not willing to blend into the culture there and you're not able to blend into the working ethics over there then there may be you know uh, a difference but uh, by and large that was definitely not a challenge that i faced okay. um the challenge i faced actually was more in india where you know even now i think if you're a woman entrepreneur <laughs> uh, it's not immediately um accepted and so i even had a pf uh, guy when we set up the indian entity and i was visiting and my business partner who's a white uh, male was also visiting the indian officers and the the pf guy had come because we just had a pf in the company and we were rolling it out and obviously he was, he was fishing for some uh, under the table stuff so i came out and i had a chat with him and i said look you know if you have a compliance issue no oh, there's a compliance issue ma'am like what's the compliance issue and he tried to you know uh, faff his way through it and i said look mm-hmm. i don't think this is a compliance issue and if there is any any issue that we've had because we honestly don't want to be doing things uh unethically do let us know and you know we'll rectify it if there are fines to be paid we'll do it and of course he could find nothing but he tried mm. then he saw the white man walking inside and said can i speak to your boss oh uh, gosh like, oh my gosh okay, you all right you want to speak to my boss uh, and then i called the boss and the boss said i'm sorry you'll have to speak to her because she's my boss <laughs> so you do face this but you've got to take it in a stride i think you need to have a sense of humor about it and you really don't have to um take it to your ego and just i think move yeah. on um so but that's pretty much it sorry no other gory stories from the <laughs> and i'm so thankful you don't have those but uh, you know talking about the incident that you just shared i always think of taylor swift's song shake it off yes. uh, because you know you just have to be like we we give the uh, the analogy of the lotus leaf right it mm-hmm. it's in water but it's never you know you need to right. be a little bit like that yes uh, just don't let them get to you don't let the haters get on into your head because True. it's going to only distract you Absolutely. you've brought about a very interesting point around taking along your team you know and that comes at a certain stage of your startup journey yes. right um uh, if we just go back a little bit because i'm sure a lot of people who are going to uh, you know view this interview uh they're just getting started Mm-hmm. So if you don't mind sharing a few tips with them in terms of how do you go about forming the right team mm-hmm. right uh who you can then later on and take and move along that that comes later but how the first step is about forming the right team how do you go about doing that smita um i i wish i had an easy answer to it mm-hmm. um i think the reality is that you need to look hard and you need to learn to trust Yeah. right um you don't accept the first thing that comes your way because quite often a lot of people don't set up a strong uh, second level management team because of funds right they're yeah. like oh this person is going to be expensive i don't think i can afford mm. it let me also do the job yeah you know and then whenever the company gets bigger but then you're sort of you know catch 22 situation because the company is not going to get bigger because you're so busy trying to keep it afloat that you're not able to focus on growth so mm-hmm. my first um um learning here which i'd like to share is you know don't worry about the future everybody has a 30 day 60 day 90 day notice period take people on board in good faith right explain the situation to them and just you know paddle hard to make the numbers that you need to make and hope that this person will be able to cope if you do find yourself in the unlucky situation that they're not then find somebody else or then you know um then share your load with a few more people in the organization yeah. but i think uh, the focus should be on hiring the right second in command in the organization or the right two or three people in the organization who will then even though initially they may seem expensive will justify uh themselves in the you know coming um time periods right, right. so say hire somebody that you will need a year from now rather than somebody immediately um at Absolutely. this stage right um yeah. 
later you could then you know take your time about finding uh, more hires or delegate it on to somebody else but i think finding the right team is very important in hiring right and two is um communication yeah it's very important to communicate with the team at all points in time and being transparent in your communication if the company is doing well let them know and share yeah. your uh, benefits if the company is not doing too well let them know don't tell them how bad it is that they <laughs> jump ship but let them know look it's tough these are the measures that we're taking so we will really look forward to having your support and then when the company is doing well obviously everybody is going to benefit of the back yeah. and you'll find that most people are uh, are uh, appreciative of the transparency that comes um with uh, with the trust that you have in them and helps in keeping the team along um very often you may not actually realize what talent you have in the team right so the more you share and you ask for suggestions you may actually get opinions and uh, points of view and answers in there that you yourself would not have thought about and very i think it's really really quite important uh, in in ensuring that you have a good team because then they have a sense of ownership they feel like they are also involved in the way the business is evolving and that uh, culture then you know easily percolates downwards it's a lot easy for good culture to go downstream yeah. than it is to push its way up of course and i think what i also heard there was just a a, a slight hint of that right in terms of the values that you know you have you mm-hmm. need to ensure that you hire people who you know who have similar mm-hmm. value systems uh because like you said it, otherwise for example if things are not going well and uh, they support you that means you are together in it right and hopefully for the long run but if they jump the ship you should be like thank goodness this came along because now i know that i maybe did not have the right team and i'm going to start all over again if need be but Absolutely. i think just having that kind of clarity in your head also helps no uh, in order to keep moving forward absolutely uh, you've absolutely. said it right you've said it yeah. right i mean it's totally what that is yeah and i loved the point that you shared earlier around having that support system as well because you did allude to that saying that you know uh to vent it out uh mm-hmm. you had somebody who was your internal team of managers it could be somebody external as well right uh, who can help you do that so so thinking about all these right um Of course one of the things you want to do as an entrepreneur is become really successful and what success means to you maybe you define it for yourself right so have you had any uh, any mantra of success uh, saying that yeah this is how I'm going to go about it have you had any such mantra uh, my my mantra has always been um, perseverance i think keep at it um so um and it's 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 there's a there's a beautiful steely dan song most people have probably not heard of the band mm. but this band steely dan so it's what i do right and every time i um sort of um struggled uh, those odd days you know when things are hard and you're struggling to get to the office you wake up and you say look this is what i do this is what i do well and so i am just going to keep at it and uh, the flowing river carves its way through rocks right so um why should i why should i not use that analogy and uh, for me perseverance has always been mantra the mantra of uh, you know perseverance and uh, keep going at it and i think that um, for me at least has worked i mean it may seem contradictory to pivot but pivot is a strategy versus perseverance is going towards your goal and your goal can be anything right making a difference in the media space um making transport better uh, for human beings or healthcare better for uh, for everybody else so that doesn't need to change it's just how you get there yeah so i think have a very clear destination mm-hmm. how you get there may change you yes. know your why and your what may remain mm-hmm. but how you are getting there may change and it should because yes. if you are too hell bent on doing it there's only one way to do it and that's the only way to go about it uh um, you know you may face some headwind over there but if you i love the analogy you gave you know because water has such a beautiful ability to make space wherever it goes uh and the analogy that you gave about the river really resonates in that sense uh but i also hear that you know throughout all the journey that you've had i see this and i'm particularly very close to this concept of resilience right uh and uh, have you how have you shown resilience right in that sense uh how do you remain resilient how do you know that this is it i'm not going to give up whatever the challenges i face I think I'm a very greedy person. 
I, I love that you're saying that out loud. <laughs> <laughs> I think I want to know more. I want to learn more. Um, and I think that sort of adds to my resilience because I'm like, oh God, there's got to be more to this, right? How do I get more of this? And in that sense is what I mean by greed. Not that I want to know. I know. <laughs> Flew it on back, which incidentally I don't have and don't plan to get. But I think, you know, the, the need to want to do more, the need to... Um, uh, learn more is what keeps me going and keeps me resilient because again you know when you start looking at uh, opportunities and setbacks right learnings and setbacks I think uh, a lot of it can keep you going right um, and also I think the the fear of becoming old and redundant is a very strong uh, force to making you resilient I'm like oh my god am I hitting that big number already what else <laughs> can I do to prove myself right yeah. so I think resilience comes in every human being more so in women and uh, we're just afraid to show it it could be our upbringing it could be our natures um, i don't think there's one reason why somebody is the way they are but i think if you look inside and uh, you know um, and and explore you'll find that you're able to withstand almost every situation that you put in if you give yourself a chance and uh, that's where i find my resilience coming in from because i think i just Every day, I want to be able to do more, and uh, that uh, helps me personally to um, to overcome circumstances and challenges, and and find something new to look forward to. Wow. Oh my God, that is so deep. I I love it. I'm just reflecting on that right now, <laughs> uh, and so I completely agree with that because we all come with different backgrounds, and uh, we don't even give ourselves enough credit for the resilience that we've shown. And you know, it, it's not just about uh, the way I look at it, right? It's not just about the big things that you've done. I think resilience is also in the smaller things that we do every single day, right? The micro stressors that we face. Mm -hmm. How are we overcoming those, right? Oh, this is urgent. It's on fire. We need to do this. But we, we tend to not celebrate those. I think Absolutely. the more we celebrate that, the more we reflect on that, we just have more capacity within us to take in more and to, you know, um, to just keep going in that direction and the destination that we've set for ourselves. You've said it so beautifully. I could not do it better. I'm going to note it down. <laughs> Use it later. But yes, you're absolutely right. And you've said it so well in a way that I could not articulate. So thank you beautifully. No, said. you. it came from you, Smita. I, uh, but I so like had a wonderful conversation with you, Smita, and so inspiring. And I hope that, you know, we get an opportunity to meet up over a cup of coffee or something like that. We'd love that. That would uh, be great. Yeah. Any any last words that you have for the entrepreneurs who are listening to this, who are hearing this or viewing this interview? Yeah, absolutely. Um, ladies and uh, maybe the occasional gent who's probably looking at it. Um, I think it is a beautiful journey. Everything we do in life is a entrepreneurial journey, whether you are somebody's uh, partner, whether you're somebody's uh, spouse, whether you're somebody's child or your somebody's parent uh, and parenthood especially is a beautiful beautiful journey and it's it's new you're learning every day with each one of these roles and i think we are already entrepreneurs in our own rights in so many ways um, and we don't celebrate it enough as you said um, so at any point in time if you have doubts on whether you're you're doing the right thing by becoming an entrepreneur um, i would say take a day off come back the next day and start again because there is so much more to do in this world and i think people need it the world needs it whether you're running a climate sustainability collaborative whether you're running a new way of looking after children or uh, the elderly whether you're uh, focused on pieces of healthcare that have been not been looked at whether you're joining up the fintech pieces that are right now so badly broken or you're doing something that you love and you know that other people also enjoy doing I don't think you should stop because somewhere something that you're doing will provide happiness. And I think that in itself is so worth the journey. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Smita, for those inspiring words. Uh, I'm sure uh, this is going to reach far uh, and people will be able to resonate it for sure. hundred percent. Thank you very much for your Thank time you. here. Lovely to talk to you. Same here. The pleasure was all mine. Thank you.